Hello everyone and welcome to Restorative Health Solutions. If you understand what's making you sick, then you can start to understand how to get better. More information is power. Hello, this is Dr. Warren. And today I wanna to talk a little bit about mold illness because it's something we've gotten more questions on in the last few years, probably more than I have the last decade. Uh, the last two years, it's become much more of a hot topic, but we've been doing it now for over a decade, so I think we should kind of talk through it, some of our experience with it, and also I'll try to break it down to some very useful tips. Now, we are expanding some of our mold content, so we're going to be doing more in-depth dives on each topic. This is meant to be a little bit of an overview, a little bit just of a history of some of our um, mold journey and why we kind of came to where we are. So the first time I was exposed to mold being the source of your chronic illness, the source of your chronic fatigue, the source of your chronic neurological problems, the source of chronic pain was in 2013. So this was back when my wife was still ill, right about the same time we started to figure out she had tick-borne illness and Lyme disease. And there's a lot of crisscross between the Lyme disease world and the mold world. Neil Nathan, uh, Dr. Richard Horowitz, come to mind. They both are doctors who help both Lyme and are aware of that, that mold um, also creates a very similar presentation in a patient many times. While we're looking for these, I came across mold and I did, doc I did training with Dr. Richie Shoemaker. Now, at that time, I can't say that that training was all that helpful. It made me aware that there's this exposure to a biotoxin followed by the whole body creates this inflammatory response and everything breaks down. It introduced me at the time to more advanced inflammatory testing, things like MMP9 and TGF-beta and MSH. So it was very helpful in my understanding, this is back 11, 12 years ago now. But his actual protocol at that time was all off-label medications because he's a medical doctor. That's really all he had used. So I did not find it practically to be very helpful we ended up doing some testing and if we found it sending off to someone who could do parts of the protocol but it was not a large part of my practice now we went back and did training again in 2018 so five years later and by this time um, dr shoemaker had partnered with someone named dr andrew Heyman, and dr Heyman had taught integrative medicine he was at george washington university at the time i think he was up in michigan before that he had experience in more integrative medicine, and so he was doing research on various steps of Dr. Shoemaker's protocol and which ones he could do more naturally and which ones the meds um, worked for and he couldn't find other options. But I walked away from that training with many of the different Shoemaker steps. I had natural alternatives and found I got pretty decent results. And so we started doing more mold testing and more work with patients who are suffering from mold, probably from 2018 onwards. But I will tell you, at 2013, one of the struggles we got is both Lyme and mold felt very similar. There was really not a ton of published data on it. There was no major university funding or NIH funding. You certainly had some doctors who had dedicated their life to trying to help this problem, just like Lyme disease. But in the 10 years since, you know, Lyme, I now have research from John Hopkins, Harvard, Columbia, Tulsa, MIT. Um, there's so much more research on the Lyme front, still so much more to go, need so much co-infection. There's really none of that happened on the mold front. So when I look at the last decade of push on the Lyme front, I have lots of modern research, which is very exciting. Now, the mold front has really taken off in my world, in the functional medicine world. So I, we can talk about it at seminars. I have more books on it. It's not only Dr. Shoemaker, um, Neil Nathan. Talked about it with Dr. Peter Osborne, Dr. Jill Carnahan, <laughs> Dr. Jill Krista. So you're, you're getting multiple books, multiple healthcare practitioners. We're going to educational seminars and getting so many people's different story. But I have no major medical research institutions backing this up yet. And so it still feels to me very similar to the way Lyme did 10 years ago, which is unfortunate. So we can find evidence of mold. Now, most of the time at this point, 
in patients, we are practically doing the urine mycotoxin test. So very simply, you can test your urine to see if you're peeing out the poisons or the mycotoxins, the mold toxins that the molds produce. And if you're peeing them out, we know they're going through your system. This is different than testing directly for mold spores or the Shoemaker protocol of testing indirectly for some of the inflammation. I will still use that on occasion to check some of the inflammatory markers on certain people. There was a time when we ran through some of the genetic stuff he did, but what we found is practically the mold urine test is really typically the best way to track it in most people, more specific to that being the problem. So that's the test we're kind of doing. Now, there's two major parts to getting better, and this is where I'll try to wrap up today. So, so you know, we've done mold training a few times. We've had some mold experiences in our own lives. I'll let Dr. Paul share a lot of those details in this story. But what do you have to do in order to get better from mold? The first thing you have to do is get out of the mold. I can't get you better from mold if you're breathing it in all day constantly. This is similar to trying to get rid of Lyme disease, but every day you get home and you get bit by a new tick. So you just can't be constantly exposed to a moldy environment. And this is typically either work or home. Now, one of the dead giveaways we have for mold is if you got sick within about six months of moving into a new location, either work or home, or you got sick within six months of known water damage or doing you know, big exposures to mold. Now, that's not everyone's story, but that is the question. If it really happens right around a move or a change in scenery, become very, very suspicious that mold may be up to play. And if you breathe it in all day, it's, it's almost impossible to detox it out of you. So we do need some investigation into where you're living or where you're working to try to be in a non-toxic moldy environment. We will make a whole separate video on a variety of inspectors and methods and things we've learned because that has been the biggest learning curve in this area. And that's usually where we get the most questions. We will cover that on its own in another video. Now, besides cleaning out the space you're living in without going crazy and living in a van in the desert, okay? You don't think you need to do that, just so you know, but we'll get to that in another video. You also have to clean the mold out of you. Now, to clean mold out of you, you need three basic things that Dr. Paul and I have found are essential. One, you need something that's good for your liver. You know, we can use things like milk thistle, N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, or a myriad of other liver nourishing nutrients because in the end, this is a toxin your liver has to clear out. Now also, mold can colonize and grow in you. So you need something that's got anti-yeast, antifungal activities here. So this can be caprylic acid, grapefruit seed, garlic, oregano, some of our favorites, but certainly not the only things. And then lastly, you need something that binds mold. You see, one of the key features of the mold toxin that makes it different than so many other toxins is when your liver detoxes it, dumps it through the cystic duct system, through the gallbladder, and it goes into the intestines, most toxins you then eliminate out by pooping, by through the feces. The unique part about the mold toxin is you have this bile recycling pathway. And the bile recycling pathway, the mold toxin can ride in on that recycling pathway. So we tell people this is similar to, you take all the trash out to the curb, and before the garbage man comes to pick it up, you take all the trash out, put it back in your house. And the garbage man keeps picking up an empty trash can. So for this reason, you need something to grab it when it's in the intestine so it doesn't just recycle and go round and round and round in circles in your system. So for a brief review, the basics, basics of getting better from mold are, number one, we gotta make sure you're not constantly breathing it in. That is very important. And sometimes can be very straightforward and sometimes can be very tricky. Now, next, there's three parts to getting out of you. We need something that's good for your liver, and we need something that helps you kill anything that's colonized inside of you, and then we need something to bind the mold and not let it go around. Some of our favorite binders are things like zeolite, espalardi, beets, and chlorella. There's other binders, certainly. These are some of the ones that we use frequently in the office, but I just meant to give you a few examples. Now, other questions we get is how long does it take to detox from mold? Now that can depend. Things like saunas and other things that help with detox can always speed it up. In some people, you can get mold done where you get out of the moldy environment and it's really a three to six month process. I do consider that to be fairly fast. There's certainly people who genetically are not good at detoxifying mold and it can take longer, three, six, 12 months for some people. If you can't clear mold in 12 months, we generally become extremely suspicious that your environment isn't clean, you're being continually exposed. 
This isn't a hard rule, but I do become increasingly suspicious if you're not better after cleaning up the moldy environment and cleaning up you. In about a six to 12 month time frame, we expect you to be getting pretty good results. And then as always, sometimes you have to reboot and rebuild the parts of your body that really took the brunt of the attack. If the mold is really hard on your gut, it's very hard on hormones, so extremely common that after you're better, you still have to do some hormone balancing things because that system gets hit pretty hard. Sometimes it can hit the neurological system or the cardiovascular system very hard. And so, as always, you're getting rid of a toxin, and then sometimes we do have to spend some time repairing whatever part of you kind of took the brunt of the attack. I'm Dr. Warren. I hope you found this really big, basic overview of mold illness um, helpful. And we'll have more data coming all around the site about specific topics more in depth. Thank you.